So we're here today, uh, surviving the COVID-19, the Corona crisis. And as entrepreneurs, um, some of us are, are in different spots. And today we're gonna be talking to somebody who's building an early stage tech company uh, here in Sacramento. And it's been growing like crazy. He just wrapped up a series A with a, uh, a well-known VC. I mean, things are moving in the right direction. And then all of a sudden, this crisis hits. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about like, what is it like to be an early stage company that gets hit with this? Um, what does it mean for potentially future fundraising? What does it mean in terms of, uh, you know, how do you deal with all your employees? Um, and then how do, uh, how do you navigate the work from home thing for you as an entrepreneur? How do you have yourself in the right mindset to win, to stay busy, to continue to attack? And so today I'm really proud to, uh, to be bringing on Brandon Brown. He's the founder and CEO of a company called Grin. Brandon, how you doing, my man? I'm doing great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the intro and looking forward to chatting with you. Definitely yeah, wild crazy. times, but we're uh, we're hanging in there and persevering. It's crazy times. Now, when you say persevering, well, let you walk us through what's uh, what's like life like right now for uh, for Brandon Brown for Grin, and maybe a little background too, would probably uh, uh, on your company, so we can uh, if there's anybody new listening, they sort of have a, a sense as to what type of business it is. Yep. Yep. So, yeah you know, thanks for, for having me on. This is my uh, second time chatting with you on one of the podcasts and really enjoyed our conversation last time. So yeah, my name is Brandon. I'm the CEO of Grin. Grin is a software technology company based here in Sacramento, although we're now slowly starting to hire some, some remote employees, but we sell a influencer marketing software. We call it a CRM for influencer marketing. And what our product does is it helps brands manage large scale influencer marketing programs so Instagrammers, YouTubers, people like this, and they create content and drive buzz around their, their brand uh, with our product. So yeah, looking forward to getting into, you know, the effects on our business today. And then also talking a little bit about some of the local small businesses. Uh, my wife owns a, a small business in town called Mist Body Bar. That's a, a spray tanning, teeth whitening and retail. And it's been pretty interesting to watch how the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected her, her business as well. Yeah, let's make sure we contrast uh, your company, right? It's obviously a, a, a way different company, right? Being a influence, you know, being a software as a service type of thing, and and she's doing a service where you her uh, her business. I take it you have to she has to be there in order to make uh, the teeth whiter and all that sort of stuff and get the tans going. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the uh, when you think about the two businesses, it's right. They couldn't be different, but but the. The singular dimension really about what's going on is that I think no one is immune, right? And uh, even businesses that feel like they're on the right side or the optimistic side of what's going on in the world, like are, are still having challenges. And, and I think we've seen that show up in our business. And so if you think about our business, you know, rationally and logically, it's like, what does our business do? Well, we help consumer brands drive buzz on social media and sell products online through e-commerce. And so during this, this pandemic and the stay at home order, it's like, what are consumers doing? They're staying at home, they're engaging with more social content than ever, and they're buying things online. And so it's been this really interesting juxtaposition for me, especially as it, it all started to unfold, because I know rationally, like we have a business that's, that's pretty well in the target zone that should be doing well, right. but at the same time, like we've seen a dramatic effect to sales, uh, mid-contract relief from customers. Uh, and it's been a really, really challenging few months for, for, for the whole company. Well, interesting. So yeah, let's, well, okay, let's dive into your business a little bit and, and let's talk about the industries that, um, that maybe would be affected by your, uh, you know, by the crisis, right? You talk about these consumer brands, some consumer brands are getting uh, hammered. Um, we just saw today, uh, Neiman Marcus, File, which is kind of a, is a retailer. Um, they filed bankruptcy today. Um, I know Uber is doing layoffs, Airbnb. So the hospi hospitality and leisure, uh, we, I assume we're going to see a, we're seeing a drop in their ad spend. Is that, um, 
Is that a fair statement? I mean, those guys for sure, but just generally certain industries are, are just dialing back the ad spend. Yeah. So it's like, um, hospitality travel. And then what we're seeing on our end, a lot of what we call consumer discretionary was, has, have, has really been hit hard. So things that are, um, that wouldn't be purchased in, in a recession, right. On when people are, are thinking about, okay, maybe I just got laid off or, um, the future is very uncertain. They start thinking about, you know, their purchases differently. And we've seen consumer discretionary take a, a big decline. But then, you know, on the, uh, one of the, the, the people who's on our board, you know, great investor, he, he, he described some of the companies in their portfolio as what he calls surge companies. So companies that are on, you know, uh, the work from home consumer staples is what we're seeing in our product. And these things that are, that are really important in this kind of new framework for how the world is going to operate. Some of those companies are, are, are growing really fast. And so, um, you know, with, with our business being B2B, like we've been negatively impacted and we've been shifting our go-to-market to say, okay, you know, how can we lean into the comp- How can we help the companies that aren't doing as well as, as they should be? And what can we do there to, to help work with them on contract terms and relief and give them free access to the tool if appropriate? And then the companies that are doing well, how can we shift our go-to-market to, to get more of those people into the pipeline, uh, evolve the product to make sure that we're solving their needs uh, and, and trying to be, you know, iterative and, and pivot the model to, to make sure we can pull through. Yeah. So I think it's probably best that we disclose as well. So I am a, uh, I'm an early stage investor into uh, grin. I'm fortunate enough to have, have ridden some of this uh, success, some of this growth. Um, and then we know a lot of people uh, in common um, and, and today I'm hoping to get you uh, all into the, uh, EO entrepreneurs organization. So we'll talk, uh, talk to you a little more about that later on tonight. I know you're looking to sign up for EO, but thinking about the businesses that are sort of in my portfolio, you were in my backyard earlier in, I guess it was last year where we had a lot of our portfolio companies there. So, you know, some of the other people that I'm invested into, some of them are in the food space, which feels like it's a a little more essential um, and maybe even food to go, right? In, in other words, food that um, is delivered automatically. I'm in a couple of those. You know, we know Greg Conley, uh, Trifecta Nutrition. Um, I think, you know, Food Jet. Some of these companies are are succeeding. Um, and I, I guess, I guess, especially in Greg Conley's business, Trifecta, it doesn't seem so discretionary. That seems to be a, uh, a, a very healthy, largest organic meal delivery company in the nation, I believe. And that seems like a discretionary item, but it appears to be doing pretty well. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And it's, it's so it's like, um, I think they're doing well. Yeah, I don't have kind of the details there, but I'm, I'm a customer. I'm probably customer. not sure the guy that's supposed to be sharing that information, but I have a sense that they're doing pretty well. Yep. And so, and I'm, I'm a customer of theirs and I still, that still comes to our house. And so, uh, I mean, I know I'm continuing to pay for that. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty wild to watch, right? So, as the CEO, the first question I asked as this all started to unfold, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that we were very proactive on transitioning to work from home. We moved the team home. We were able to make that transition in less than 36 hours and, and really didn't skip a beat. And so the first question I had was, was how much is our sales demand going to slow? Like how much, how much, like, are we just going to keep cranking right through this? Like, how is this going to affect us? And I wasn't totally sure. And then what we saw, you know, pretty quickly, uh, there was a little bit of a lag, a few week lag, but we saw our sales pipeline. So pipeline is the stage before we actually close a deal and there's multiple stages, but we saw a sales pipeline just, just tank dramatically, like late, late March into mid April. Um, and so then the big question was like, are these, are the brands, the trifecta nutritions, the, you know, the watch company, the consumer staples or discretionary company, the consumer brands who are doing influencer marketing, are they rattled? Or is it like a a systemic change to how they're going to operate? And they actually don't think this is like a part of the new normal. And, and, you know, that question was a big question for me. And I think over the last like 10 days, what we've really started to see is a really uh, big reversal of that trend. We've seen our sales pipeline pick back up. We've seen people start to engage with our team. And, and the way that I describe that is like, it feels like the management teams at these brands, the, the CFO and or the VP of finance and, and the CEO said, no more spending, 
go renegotiate all the contracts with all your vendors, free up money, no more spending. They did that for two or three weeks. Then they went into a, a, a boardroom or a meeting room. And they said, okay, where are we going to go now? Right? Where we have to spend because we have to make moves in this world. Where are we going to go? Uh, and it feels like Grin is, is, is in that, that pocket of where we're going to go now. And so I think we're starting to see some positive effects. But, you know, that said, like, we're not, we're not out of the woods and we have, you know, have a long way to go and it's daunting and, and, you know, to be transparent and just raw, like it's, it's can be scary. And, and as the leader, like you have to, you know, you have to be strong and optimistic and, and help the team see the way forward. Um, but it's, it's not easy to do when you're dealing with, with something like this. And for me, you know, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties. I've never really been through anything like this as a business owner and CEO. Um, and so it's, it's a new thing for me, for sure. Well, let's, let's talk about that because that's interesting for you to be so uh, transparent um, that it's scary, right? Because as entrepreneurs, there's a lot of people relying on us. Um, what's, what's the fear? What, how does that manifest itself into in somebody like yourself, Brandon? What, is, what does fear look like to you? What are you afraid of? Well, I think yeah, maybe fear is not the right word. I think it's more of like, you've been climbing this mountain for so long and you're like looking up the mountain and it's just daunting, right? Cause it's, it's when you first start, like you've created something from nothing and it was so hard to get to a point where we could go raise a venture round in the Bay area and bring people like you on as investors and build the team to 50 plus and, and become, you know, arguably number one in our category. And, and that, that's such a long arduous process. And then to, to feel like you're, you're, and I don't think that this is the case for us long-term, but over the last two months have been hard for us last month, month and a half to feel like you're almost like sliding back down the mountain. It's, it's not fear. It's, it's almost more of like, okay, this, we're looking up another mountain now and we have to dig in again. And we've been here before and, and making sure that you, you're, you're still excited and you have the perseverance to get through it. I mean, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, you talk about leadership because um, I, uh, you know, we have, uh, I've got employees here at Haney Biz as well. And um, so I, I will say I have had some fear and anxiety. I've lived through a few of these things. Um, and so I always sort of refer back to the way I deal with my fear is I sort of uh, refer back to the other tough times that have been in my life. It's sort of my coping mechanism um, and whether we want to call it fear, it's not fear for my life, but it's, it's fear that I might let somebody down that I really care about. I feel like that's what is my big concern. And maybe there's a little bit of pissed off in this where you're like, I can imagine for you, um, you, know, you guys are on a great trajectory, right? You have climbed some mountains, you've, you're high stepping at some level and then damn it, I'm punt. Are you kicked in the nuts? I've got to, uh, sort of reconfigure i mean we had we had uh momentum um and now you sort of get kicked and it's like almost like pissed off in this um and i don't know if you felt that at all i have i have felt that a little bit myself yeah i, w I would agree and i think um that's that's a good way to describe it and it's I, I would say as a leader and as a ceo the 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 easiest thing to do in this situation is to in my view was to react. You can react quickly. And, and sometimes people can, can confuse fast action and being reactive for decisiveness and good decision-making. But the, the balance that we've really been trying to make inside the company is this idea of being measured versus reactive. And so for us, like you, I think what business owners and CEOs and founders need to do is they need to really take inventory of their business and say, how do I think this is going to affect me? Like you have to deal with the reality of the situation, which is sales pullback, discretionary spending is dying. You, you very likely have to, to make cuts to the organization. You, you have to make those hard decisions. But when we looked at it, we said, we, we, we feel that we're on the right side of this. And right is probably not the right word, but we feel like we're on a good side of this and the future looks bright for us. So we want to be measured in our response. We want to move quickly, but we want to be measured. And we want to make sure that we have the ability to preserve the upside to the best, uh, like to, to the extent that we can. And so um, it is a little bit of pissed off, but it's also an opportunity to, to demonstrate like what I think is true leadership, which is, you know, 
we have optimism and faith in the future and we are going to, we are going to get through this and we are going to come together as a team and we are going to charge forward. And when the rest of our competitors, and I'm not saying that we, there may not be challenging decisions that are coming up for us in the future. Like we're not out of the woods, but I do know that we have a really strong team, a really strong set of values and a very collaborative culture and our team is digging in. Um, and I know that not everybody, you know, has that. And so when I think about the competitive environment, like, I have high confidence that our team can 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 emerge through this while the rest of, of our many of our competitors, I think, are looking at the ground trying to pick up the pieces because they have reactive leadership that let let the fear get to them. Interesting. I, uh, I think in many ways, I agree with that. I mean, the, the, the I guess the, the mindset of after you, uh, I guess, pick yourself back up, get yourself regrouped, you you um, you've created uh, the the inven you know that you've got your balance sheet or your assets and so on once you start making those plans i think if um uh, if you still have some um i guess uh you got something in the war chest uh, i think this is a great time to seize opportunity and gain market share and i and i know other people that are are thinking that way i'm thinking that way as an investor this might be a great time to see opportunities i wouldn't have seen before um, help in ways that maybe I, I wasn't able to help uh, before, wasn't necessarily needed as much. So I'm hoping that this is really a way for to see things opportunistically. And I can imagine that this is going to, what I've seen is it's sort of escalating some of the obvious things that were already going to happen. The move to online, the pain, you know, the brick and mortar, um, the weaker players maybe not making it um, and stuff like that. But um, I agree with you, with your business, it's well positioned to help people who are doing e-commerce and online business. And so it seems to me that you are in a, a good spot and that if you can gain market share while others are reeling maybe or uns unsure, if you can be attacking while others are still regrouping, that that might be really, really good for you two, three, four, five years down the road. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree 100%. And so, I, I mean, I've had so many of these conversations with people like you, usually on the phone, you know, not live on a podcast or on zoom. Um, and this idea of playing offense, I think is just so crucial to, to how we're thinking through this. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to defend the company and make sure that we make really astute decisions that, uh, you know, we do the right thing by the team and the, the stakeholder group that's invested into the company. But you know, if, if you have the fortitude to, to see the opportunity in the chaos uh, and hang on and continue to execute, I think the, the rewards are, you know, incredible on the other side. And we'll see kind of how this plays for us over the next few years. But, you know, I think you encapsulated it well. And that's, you know, absolutely what I, I feel. Um, you know, and I think there's other ways that you can you can deliver value in an environment like this. Like, right, it's not all about ARR or revenue growth. Like for us, we're, we're a growth stage company. Like, our model relies on growth. That's, that's, that's how our model works. We have to grow and we need to grow fast. But the story that I've, I've been, you know, contemplating is, is like, what, what is our story on the other side of this? Like maybe our growth slows or maybe we're flat for a few months or maybe we continue to, to double ARR, but there's a lot of things that we can do to improve the fundamentals of the business during this time that not only make for a great narrative in the next phase, but are also really exciting to work on. And, and so for us, it's like about, you know, how can we deeper understand like our customer retention and segmentation and where are the customers that are really delivering value? Like, uh, how do we get more of those and what parts of the product do they really love and can they not leave without and where are the parts of the product that are falling off? And so there, there are multiple projects, I think, that are, that are like a winning mindset that are offensive, that, that don't just have to revolve around growing revenue. And I think the challenge for the CEO and the management team inside the company is to identify those uh, and go after those. So you're making progress, even if, even if people aren't buying, like there are ways to make progress. You know, it's interesting. So, and I don't know if you've thought about this yet, um, but it makes you think about, okay, the next round. So people who might be listening, uh, somebody goes and gets their seed round, then it's a series A, and then a lot of times it's a series B. And then you sort of have these different times where you go out and get a little bit more money to continue to throw fuel on the fire, right? To continue to grow. And, and a lot of companies are, well, I guess one of the dreams for a lot of companies is to have either a really successful exit or maybe a go public or something like that. 
when I was uh, had CNBC on earlier, and I um, I saw an early stage company. Uh, have you heard of Lime before? It's a I think it's a ride sharing uh, app. Um, you know, for like uh, bicycles or something like that. I'm I, mm. I'm not super familiar with it, but they're uh, they're probably a little further along than you guys in terms of you know they've gone out and raised uh, maybe a little bit more money. And I think Uber is making investment. In, Uber is doing layoffs and then making an investment into this company, which is interesting. CEO is on CNBC, and he was talking about yeah, we decided we wanted to uh, go out and raise more money in this environment um, to strengthen the balance sheet and, and really to because this is a time to grow market share apparently for them. Um, and, but he's doing a down round. I thought that was interesting that it was worthwhile to, you know, maybe even offensively uh, take a down round, right? Where you raise money at a little bit lower valuation, but to give yourself more uh, offensive firepower, if you will, versus just survive. How do you, uh, is it, is it ever worth it? to go, well, I'm going to raise money, even though it's going to cost uh, a little bit more. It might even uh, affect my investors a little bit uh, on, the, on the downside, but it might be the time where, wow, an extra five, 10 million bucks to, uh, to spend on marketing right now and growing fast, growing your way out of it because you've got such a good business model. I don't know. Is that something that you would ever consider? Um, well, I, I think based on just our growth, so our last round was seven months ago, seven, yeah. eight months ago. I think, I don't think we would have, we would be, we would have to entertain a down round. Um, great, uh, great timing, would, by the way. <laughs> yeah, which is great. So I don't think we'd have to entertain a down round because we're, uh, we're in a much, much better position just on all, on every metric. Um, that said, I think to me, it's logical because it's, it's all about, it's all about what your goals are, right? So what are, what are the goals and, and uh, you know, who, who have you raised money from? And also what are your personal goals and what's the type of impact that you want to make with the company? And to me, there's a very logical rationale for taking some near-term dilution in order to put some cash in the bank and capture some upside on the back end of this, because the way that you grow your equity value out of the back is through about growing the valuation, right? And I, I can see that like it's, it's, you can look at like the, the dilution, which you'd have to take uh, in, in a down round as an investment into stability in a future where there's going to be a lot less players. And, you know, as such, you know, if you're, if you're not already number one in the category, you have the ability to really go capture number one. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's the situation that we're in is that, you know, people who, people who have optimism and smile and come in and, and do the work and, you know, have their heart and head in the right place. And it's really about trying to, to build value long-term and thinking long-term. I could see why they would entertain that. And then there's, but there's also this, there's, there's also this, they, who knows, you know, to play the devil's advocate, they could be in just a distressed situation and wow. they, uh, they need the cash and, and they just, it's the best of a, a handful of bad choices. Yeah. Um, so you never really know until you're in that room and, and you can, you know, and you can have a conversation with them, but I, I could see kind of the logic in both angles. Yeah, well, great timing on your uh, on your raise, I think, and obviously uh, I'm uh, proud to be invested um, as well. But let's contrast it now. We talked about this a little bit at the beginning. So your wife has a small business. So there's a lot of our uh, uh, listeners, and I think when a lot of people think of um, entrepreneurship, we some of us think um, fast growing rocket ship tech company. Other but others of us think about you know, the entrepreneur next door who might have a, uh, a service business, a hairstylist. In your case, uh, your wife's got a um, uh, teeth whitening and tanning. Wow. So it's, they've got all the pretty people rolling through her business. Uh, sounds <laughs> like that would be a fun business to be a part of. Uh, you never yes. asked me to invest into that one. Uh, I don't think she's taken investors. Uh, so yeah, she's, uh, she's the, the sole owner. So yeah, so she owns Mist Body Bar. It's organic spray tanning. Uh, and teeth whitening as well as retail. So it's located on 30th and J in Midtown Sacramento. Uh, it's the the number one spray tanning and and that type of location in Sacramento. Uh, you know by a bunch of metrics online by by a long shot. And I think, you know, she's a, I just have so much respect for her. And you know, obviously I love her. She's my wife, but she's she's built the whole thing on her own. She's bootstrapped the whole thing over you know five and a half years and you know, we can really connect on that level because, you know, I go through challenging things with my work and she goes through challenging things with her work. And oftentimes it's, it's helpful just to have someone say, Hey, look, I get it. Like, I'm not trying to solve your problem, but I know like 
that's tough. I've felt that before. And to me, you know, the reason that we launched the Save Sal- Save Small Sacramento fundraiser was I was just looking at kind of the disparity there where, you know, we're tech based, we're online, we can switch and do Zoom. And granted, we have our fair share of challenges, but I have confidence we're going to be able to pull through and, you know, keep most of our team employed throughout the process. And then I look over at her and, uh, you know, she just has no revenue. They're just completely closed. And, you know, she's, it's, it's stressful for her. And there's a lot of anxiety around that because, you know, it's, it's a, it's a cash flow centric business. It, she, you know, she, she pulls money out, she pays rent. She, she's not sitting on a lot of cash with that business and she has her, all of her revenue, you know, shut down to zero. And so I think that's, uh, that's challenging. And I was trying to think, what could we actually do to help? And, and, you know, it's a, sm- it's a small thing that we've put together with this website, but it's just my, my little way of trying to help these businesses because they're not as fortunate as we are to still be open. Yeah, well, let's talk about what you do. And so you're, here we are, we have two entrepreneurs um, that uh, uh, people have a ton of respect for. It's not like you have nothing to do. Obviously, she might have a little bit more time than you. And you decided you want to be, um, I guess it's philanthropic and helpful to other people that are going through um, this alongside us uh, as entrepreneurs, what have you done? What is this site about? Um, why is it? Um, why now? And why? What can we do to get involved? Yep. Yep. Great. So, save small. The website is savesmallsac.com. It stands for Save Small Businesses Sacramento.com. And what it is is a fundraiser designed to help local Sacramento-based businesses that are unable to open and are struggling due to COVID-19 and the pandemic. So it's really geared towards uh, businesses that are going to be part of this like phase three reopening, right? So uh, phase two starts Friday, but this is takeout and curbside delivery for food. But there's a whole list of businesses that are in phase three and phase four that aren't going to be able to open for, for who knows how long. Um, and so what, what I've done is I've partnered with, um, you know, my wife's helping in, in behind the scenes you know, with some of the strategy and stuff, but really partnered with uh, a handful of business leaders. So Sabia Das from, from Manetta Ventures, uh, DJ Stefan, who was one of the founders of Skyslope, Sunny Mayugba, who's now at Spiro Ventures and a well-known entrepreneur uh, in the area, um, as well as my business partner, Brian Meacham. And we put together a site. Uh, you can go on, you can, you can donate. Um, if you want to donate, you know, a smaller personal amount, you donate through GoFundMe. Uh, and then last night we put together a, a nonprofit. So where if you if you're a business um, or someone who wants the tax receipts through, through for your donation, we have a, a way that you can do that um, and experience the tax benefits. And what we're going to do is accept applications. We already have started. There's a apply now button on the website. So if you're a small business owner who's struggling uh, and needs money for rent or you know to pay staff just to help during this time, you can go on. You can apply. There's a handful of questions. So name, contact info, business. Uh, and questions that are designed to help us understand how this COVID-19 situation has affected you. And then what we're going to do with that committee, the reason that I partnered with these people is to uh, look through those applications uh, and make some decisions around how we can deploy the capital raised to make uh, the maximum impact for small business, small businesses here locally. So pretty, pretty exciting. I've never done anything like this, which is kind of funny to say, um, I mean, I've just been so focused on my own company and, and trying to grow it. And uh, I am busy, but at the same time, you know, it feels really good to work on something that's not just about Grin and the people who are involved in Grin and, and try to find a, a way to help in our own own little way. So we're just kind of going, going and seeing how it goes. Well, I am uh, impressed by um, the sentiment. Um, I'm res- I respect the sentiment. It, you're helping Sacramento Small Business, which is sort of my... I don't know. It's something I really have a lot of respect for. I think people that uh, risk it all in order to put food on their table for their family, in order to hi- create jobs. I mean, you're the heroes of the American economy. And um, if we are going to see some fail, so if you can help one not fail or one uh, give as many times too, I don't know if you agree with this. It's, it's about confidence. When we lose that confidence as entrepreneurs, where uh, maybe hope is, um, is uh, is gone that's the time when we decide to quit in life and sometimes all it is is it, it might not even be the amount of money that you're able to feed to somebody but it's that thought that 
people care about my business, right? Other people, other entrepreneurs, other leaders of Sacramento care about me, care about my success. And that's, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do with Haney Business. Like this is like, so it's music to my ears to see or to hear what you're doing. And the, and the, I know the four people personally that are, are helping you that you mentioned, all good people. So, I mean, I think we, if we give you the money uh, and we're giving it to people that uh, we trust that are just good people who care about um, winning in business, because these guys are entrepreneurial in nature. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I got to go figure it out and see how I can contribute. Um, but I'm just so impressed. I'm just happy to, you know, when I see other people doing great things for other people, it, um, it warms my heart, even whether it's buying somebody a cup of coffee at Starbucks because they're wearing um, a military hat or they're saying pay it forward. It's like you see people doing generous things for other people. You get something out of it. So you get Brandon, you're helping people and you get something out of it. The person on the receiving end is getting something, maybe a little hope. Um, but me watching it happen, I get it uh, as well. So I'm just like uh, hats off to you, Brandon, and, and to your wife for for thinking of this, originating this idea and making, and doing something with it. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. You know, one of, one of our values in, uh, well, I agree with the sentiment, but I, and I appreciate the compliment. One of our values in Grin is this idea of just move fast, take action. And, uh, it, it's, wasn't perfect. You know, I put the site up and DJ called me from sky slope. He's like, Hey, we got to do this and we got to do this. And, you know, I think we went a little early and, and he, but then he understands, he's like, I get it. This is how you kind of move. And so, um, you know, I think to me, action is, is the most important thing. And, you know, kind of piggybacking on your comments, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy to watch because, you know, a lot of small business owners aren't going to raise their hand and ask for help, right? Like they, they are by their, they are strong willed, smart. Uh, they make things happen. They, they do things that other people think are not possible. And so what you have is you have this kind of group of people who I know are struggling, like, but they're, they're actually not going to create a fundraiser for themselves because uh, for whatever reason, it's just, it's not in the cards. They're going to find a way to hustle through it. And so, um, you know, I, I was thinking about that and I was thinking about Megan and her business. She, she would never do this for herself. You know, she would try to find how to, how to help other people. And so um, having people like you help us spread the word, uh, having the, the people who are on the site, you know, uh, help us sort through the applications and make sure the money goes to the right places. Uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm grateful to be in a position to, to, to be able to help Sacramento. I love Sacramento. You know, we're, uh, we're here for a very specific reason, uh, building our company and not somewhere else, even though it might be easier. Uh, it's because we, we love the area. And so this is our, our kind of token of, of that to, to the area. Entrepreneurs helping entrepreneurs. What a concept. Hey, Megan's not around there by any chance, is she? Uh, she's not. No, uh, she's a uh, shout running. I should pull her in. Hey, babe, come here. <laughs> uh, yeah, get her in there. Uh, well, hey, uh, Brandon, any closing thoughts? I mean, it, it, just as we, uh, you know, we can't go all day on this, I suppose. You got, you got places to be, people to see and so on. But like any closing thoughts on, uh, on entrepreneurship in Sacramento and what you're doing? Um, other, other ways that, um, other things that we might want to know about uh, how to get involved. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, I think we've covered most of it here, but I think, you know, sa the, the message I would leave with folks who are from Sacramento, like Sacramento has a pretty special thing. Like if you, if you live in Sacramento and you spend time in the area and you just are out on a Saturday afternoon or, or, you know, a Saturday night and the energy in Sacramento and the positivity and the optimism and the way that the region is growing has just been incredible to watch, you know. Um, in our company, we've been able to bring really talented people uh, from, you know, the highest leadership positions in the company all the way to frontline folks, you know, who are in various roles from other major markets who moved to Sacramento and they love Sacramento. And there's this sentiment around, wow, this is incredible. Like, I'm gonna, I want to live here forever. And I, I honestly think that small local businesses are a huge piece of that. Like, if you think about the bar that you go have a beer with your, your buddies at a pint or where you go shopping in the small retail location, or when you go into Midtown and, and grab a sandwich or, uh, you know, the, the small businesses are, I think are, are a huge piece of what make Sacramento such an amazing place to live. 
And the fact that there's trees everywhere probably doesn't help either because it's visually appealing. Um, and so I would just urge everybody to, to take a few minutes and think about why they really enjoy living here. Uh, and there's probably millions of reasons, but you know, I, think, I think small businesses are a big piece of that. And so I would just urge everybody to go to savesmallsack.com, uh, understanding not everybody's in a position to donate, but you can share the website on, on social media. Uh, and then you know, for any of the entrepreneurs or, or people thinking about starting technology-based businesses, I'm really easy to get a hold of. And I love meeting new people. And so if, if you have questions or ideas or want some feedback on, on your company or how to raise money from the Bay Area, you know, I'm, I'm all ears and, and here to help. And you know, I think together we can, we can make it happen. You are uh, something special, Brandon Brown. He's the CEO of Grin, a good buddy and somebody who, uh, who loves this town the way that we all do here in Sacramento. So thanks for, uh, thanks for being on the show, Brandon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate it. You bet. Okay. All right. That's where we'll cut it. Um, I'll shoot you that link at four for about the four o'clock call with Uriah. You got it. Um, yeah. Nice job, by the way. Hopefully, uh, you know, we'll, we'll send you over the video. Uh, and if, if cutting it is, you know, cause I, I think you might want to cut this piece that's uh, around um, the cause, if you will, that might be a good sound. There might, there's some good sound bites in mm. there that you, that you had. So, um, I think you can use that for promotional things. Cool. Yeah, man. I appreciate it. And yeah, keep me posted. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know on the EO stuff. I'm excited to dig in and hopefully see you around more through, through that group. And, uh, thanks for, uh, for hopping on and, and helping us spread the word. You bet. Glad to help. Um, I'll see how I can donate too. Thanks. Oh, you're the man. Thanks Mark. Okay. Bye.